slowly um, we get started. Um, it's now quarter past six. Um, and I guess some people will be dropping in uh, slowly and surely, uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to get started punctually and to welcome you to uh, this fifth lecture of the lecture series, uh, This is Public Health, which is brought to you by the Swiss School of Public Health and by ETH. Uh, my name is Emily Reeves, and I'm the moderator for this lecture series. For those of you who don't know me, perhaps you are familiar with me um, already from the Dubai Expo project uh, or from the Dubai Expo training program. And for those of you who don't know me, then it's nice to meet you now. And hopefully you will be with us to uh, experience the rest of this lecture series. So thanks for tuning in. Um, before we get started, just a short notice. Um, you may have noticed already that there has been a change to the program. Uh, we did have um, originally Dr. Isabel Bauman, who would have been speaking to us today about health in the context of the prolongation of work life. Unfortunately, due to COVID sickness, she was unable to uh, give this lecture, but in her place, um, very spontaneously, uh, Professor Nino Kunsley very, very kindly offered to step in and will be uh, giving us uh, a lecture today uh, in a moment. So before I hand over to Professor Kunsley, um, I will first, as we do in every session, uh, just briefly get us to have a look at one of the quiz questions that you've by now been very familiar with over the course of the last lectures, where you've got to experience how this works a little bit. So um, in just a moment, we will have a look at one of these quiz questions here, uh, which I am headed to now. Um, let me just get this quiz question up for you. Hopefully you can see this on the screen. I'm going to enlarge my screen. Um, this quiz question um, I have selected uh, from the SSPH Plus for Sustainable Health quiz, which as you know, and you've been playing, um, because it follows up from the last lecture that we had by Professor Inouen, who um, spoke to us about healthy lifestyle changes and behavior. And this quiz question is therefore uh, in tune with that. It's all about nutrition. So I thought that we'd have a look at this quiz question together and see what people think about this question. So um, the, the question is, what has been the world progress in reducing malnutrition, including undernutrition and excess weight in the last decade? So that's the question, and there are three possible options. Uh, only one of them can be right. So the first um, option is little progress has been seen for most nutrition targets worldwide. Second option is most nutrition targets have, have been achieved in developing countries. And the third option is that all desired nutrition targets have been achieved worldwide. So now very quickly, I'd like to open up the floor and see um, who pe what people think is the right answer. Feel free to write your opinion in the chat. If you don't want to voice it, that's fine. Um, but now I'd just like to quickly open up the floor for your answers. I already see some comment in the chat. So let me have a look at that. So somebody here thinks it's the second option. So most nutrition targets have been achieved in developing countries. Someone else thinks it's the first option. Another one thinking it's the first option. I see many people going for the first option. Perhaps I give it a few more seconds. Just take a guess because actually this is the point of the quiz that we all learn something new. And um, okay, more people with the first and some with the second. Oh, okay. So it seems that there's many going for the first option, but also some people going for the second option. Let's take a look and see. So I think because the majority had voted for the first, then let's try with the first option. So I'm going to select it. The first option is little progress has been seen for most nutrition targets worldwide. As you see indicated by the tick, that means that was the correct answer. This question was brought to us by one of um, our own community, SSPH Plus community, Hugo Alexandro Santa Ramirez. And um, there is an explanation which he therefore provided, which goes together with um, the quiz question. You can take a moment to briefly scan your eyes over some of these things. Um, but essentially, 
Um, the idea is, if I can read it out to you slowly, um, data from the last Global Nutrition Report shows slow prog progress in reducing malnutrition worldwide. This includes a high proportion of adults and children with overweight and obesity, 5.9% children with overweight in uh, 2008 compared to 5.5% in 2012, as well as a slight reduction in childhood stunting and wasting. I won't go into all of the um, statistics there that he's listed, uh, but one of the things that I will pick out here is that Switzerland has one of the lowest prevalence rates of obesity among developed countries, nevertheless significant variations in obesity and the risk of developing chronic diseases have been found between population groups related in some extent to diet quality. So um, please go ahead and play um, this quiz question for yourself and have a look uh, through all the different quiz questions because there are so many uh, to enjoy and to learn from in the way that we've done right in this moment. Um, you can play the quiz by scanning the QR code now or later. I have this slide uh, again at the end of the uh, um, uh, session today, so feel free to scan that now or scan it later um, and play the quiz. Um, I've also listed up there a link, um, as I do every week now, that it takes you straight to um, some student support page for counselling services, as we're very aware of what's going on in the world today, particularly with the situation in Russia and uh, Ukraine, and if you are a student and you need some support, please do not hesitate to go to this link and check out the counseling services that are available for you. Um, so as I said, um, we will be inviting Professor Nino Kunzli, who is the Dean of the Swiss School of Public Health and Head of Unit at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute to talk to us today, um, who's very kindly um, stepped in spontaneously and he will be talking to us today about clean air in urban spaces and it's possible if you want it. So I open the floor to you, Nino. Well, Emily, thank you very much. You can free the screen so I can share mine. Thank you. Well, um, I'm sorry for this uh, quite drastic change in the program today, but I think we all learned in the pandemic to accept um, changes, be flexible, and uh, it reminds us that this uh, monstrous pandemic is still not over. So we have to be ready and adapt. So in fact, um, of course, you did not expect a lecture on clean air today or on air pollution. But in fact, I have to say it's also an opportunity to do that uh, today. Um, two years ago, we had a lecture in the series of This is Public Health about air pollution. We thought this year we will not have it. Um, but here we are back. And I hope at the end of this um, somewhat shorter lecture, probably, uh, which I just got noticed this morning that I should hold it, um, you will hopefully agree that the topic is very important. And I show you actually why we conclude that it is very important. Um, let me just start with this graph here, because what this lecture also is, it is an excellent example of, uh, of a positive example of a success story of the application of evidence-based public health. Uh, you, among, among those of you who study medicine, which um, I assume a couple of you are studying medicine, uh, you are more familiar with the term of the evidence-based medicine, but actually this looks uh, very similar. The evidence-based public health cycle is just on the level of the populations, as you do know, that's where public health sciences um, are working on. So you will see an example how we apply it, this cycle, or how it gets applied, and actually how this is a success story, because based on scientific evidence, we take action, as you will see, to make a change. So air pollution as an exposure, just a very simple slide here to remind you, air pollution is a very complex beast. Yeah, it's not just one thing, it's very, tough to define it, to measure it. You can measure many, many pollutants that together are this uh, complex mixture. And as you see in this slide, depending on where you go, 
in the world, you might encounter very different sources of pollution, although some of those sources are globally typically very important. So you saw, so you see traffic no matter where you go in the world uh, in the last decades, uh, traffic has been very important. But things are changing. And what you will also see in my lecture, there's a huge inequity and heterogeneity across the globe. So these are the sources that together create this mixture of air pollution. And I don't want to show you all the single pollutants here. There are many gases. Um, but uh, just one pollutant I want to pick out, uh, these are the particles. Particles are a very important feature um, of air pollution, not only now in the pandemic, as you do know, uh, also viruses travel as tiny, tiny, small, ultra-fine particles, but it's also true for air pollution, and particles are very important carriers of a whole range of toxicants. Yeah, so particles by themselves are something very complex. And you see it, we, we define them by their size, which makes a lot of sense from a health perspective because um, size determines a bit how and where you inhale or where they get deposited in the inhalation tract. So the very small ultrafine ones, uh, ones, they will end up in the alveoli. So you see here the size fractions, and actually you see the comparison with um, other uh, biologic material like viruses. So you see we are somewhere in this range of where viruses also sit in terms of size. So particles PM, PM 2.5 up to 2.5 micrometer in diameter and PM 10 are very important features in also to describe air pollution in more general sense. Yeah, well, why would we like to keep air clean? I mean, what is this link between air pollution and outcomes? And um, I just want to emphasize, I mean, you are interested in health, we are interested in health, and that's what my research was over the last 30 years. It was all about air pollution and health. But we should not forget um, air pollution has many, many other relevant effects. Um, there is visibility. If you go back historically, visibility was a major driver uh, in the last century, in the 70s in the United States to promote clean air because they were concerned um, in these wonderful national parks that they would lose visibility. And uh, of course, I mean, there was a lot of evidence that actually this is what happened. Uh, in the last century, in the 40s, in the 50s. I mean, with air pollution, you don't see anymore. And it was about the beauty of nature that you lose this ability to see nature. And then, of course, health, but also crop. I mean, this is very important for nutrition. Some of the crops are very sensitive to some of the pollutants. For example, ozone is a very oxidative gas. As you may know, in the summer, the summer smog is typically ozone. So some of the crops like um, wheat or so, they are extremely sensitive and there are huge losses of, um, of, of the wheat harvest and, and other crops um, if these pollutants are high during a certain period um, in the, in when this uh, crop is growing actually. Also buildings, I mean, damage to buildings. If you travel the world, if you um, travel in cities with a long history of very high pollution, you see all these old black buildings. Um, actually, I remember in European cities, that was the case some 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so this is a damage to the infrastructure. And of course, everything you see here ultimately relates to <clears throat> economy. So air pollution has a huge, economic impact that it comes with, with high costs, in fact. So these are reasons. And um, of course, as an environmental epidemiologist, myself interested in health, I want to just give you this uh, graph here and the link if you are interested in understanding more about the health effects. What you just see here is very interesting what we learned in the last 30 years from, from this science, the health effects of air pollution they look quite similar to the long list of air pollution uh, of effects we now know that they are due to smoking. And in fact, that is not even surprising because I mean, smoking 
is also a form of biomass combustion with the only difference that smoking causes um, among the smokers, of course, a much, much higher exposure than what you can ever encounter in terms of air pollution, ambient air pollution, but the many, many of the toxicants are in fact the same. And um, so this is uh, not too surprising. What was more surprising over the last 30 years to, to see in the research is that we can confirm all these health effects despite these concentrations usually being much lower than what um, smokers inhale. So this is uh, in fact um, interesting. And um, yeah, so you see some of these effects are acute term effects. So we know that on days with high air pollution, more people uh, suffer from a heart attack, for example, or from a stroke. Um, or die, I mean, the death rates go up if air pollution goes up um, on the daily level. And much more important are the long-term chronic effects. So we know air pollution causes uh, a higher incidence in lung cancer or in chronic obstructive lung diseases, uh, in atherosclerosis, in fact. So even the, 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 the basic um, pathology that ultimately relates to many cardiovascular diseases is also enhanced under the influence of long-term exposure to air pollution. So you can follow this link here or the QR code if you are interested in learning more about the background on the health effects. If you are particularly interested in the, in the biologic mechanism, I can recommend this uh, most fantastic paper of uh, my friends of Annette, Tim and Andrea Baccarelli. Um, that is a really an excellent summary of what we learned in the last 30 years, how, how to explain and um, yeah, how to bring together actually the biologic mechanisms that ultimately result in this very diverse and complex picture of health effects. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is this diversity, heterogeneity of effects. So there, there is a lot of understanding. And of course, some of them are still on the level of um, hypotheses with quite some um, experimental evidence, but not final proof of the specific contribution of each of those mechanisms. Oxidative stress, inflammation is a very well-known um, effect that is also triggered or entertained by ambient air pollution. Yeah, so the impact you see here, this is in the cycle, the next question, if we know there are health effects, the question is then an important one, is it, is it relevant? Is air pollution important? Uh, as you can imagine, I mean, also in epidemiology, the, the methods that we have developed in the last 30 years have, have improved uh, in a fantastic way. So today we are able epidemiologically to observe very subtle effects. So this question whether these effects are relevant or not on the population level, it's a very important question. And I just show you one single slide that actually summarizes it all. Um, from the global burden of disease, which is a, a wonderful, uh, I would say, data factory in Seattle, who is a huge team all over the world to show and summarize the contribution of a whole range of exposures to the development of diseases in the world. And you see here, the global burden of disease is summarized a very few years ago that pollution, and this is all environmental pollution, is the biggest single driver of um, premature death, which is here, one of the outcomes that you can use. So uh, life expectancy in essence, yeah. So premature death, this contribution of the environment is bigger than of any other major killer, I would say. So you see even tobacco smoking or the big three here, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis are less than total pollution. And now given the lecture today, you may wonder what fraction of the total pollution is explained by ambient air pollution or by air pollution in general, indoor and outdoor. So you see it here. Among all environmental risk factors, air pollution is a key factor. Yeah. So what we do um, emphasize in this lecture is really important. Uh, so these are not just 
minor health effects, but it is a real driver of, um, of mortality, of diseases, and in essence of life expectancy in the world. So we have reasons to think about what we can do, and that's here this success story. Yeah? You have this treatment. Um, in a, in, as a physician, you would deal with a treatment here with some drugs or whatever, uh, also prevention. But here in the public health cycle, here it is about acting on the population level. And in terms of air pollution, it means air, clean air policies. So how do we do that? Just in a nutshell, um, and this goes back to the 1970s when this has been developed. So you need a legal framework. And I emphasize this here in this lecture series, this is public health. Um, as you will often see public health action, the prevention very often relates to policies to structural changes. Yeah? So I'm not talking about something that you deal with on an individual level. Yeah? You cannot tell your patient or your people to go home and make sure that air pollution does not happen. No, this is a structural issue. You need a legal framework to keep air clean. Yeah? So what you need, you need stringent standards for what's coming out of the tailpipe of the chimneys. Yeah, So the emission standards are crucial, clean combustion. I will show you one example at the very end. But you also need science-based ambient air quality standards. So you should define how clean air quality actually is. What, what is that? Yeah, I mean, how clean is clean? And then you need to design, plan, and adopt, and actually enforcement is a challenge. You need to have management plans, and they must be tailored to the local conditions. Sometimes this can be very local, a uh, single factory, for example, that causes a lot of pollution. And of course, um, many of the pollutants uh, are globally relevant. So if we talk about traffic, of course, a management plan relates to all the policies and in how clean an engine should be that um, the factories would sell, put on the streets. Yeah. So these management plans are a crucial element to keep clean air. Um, what I want to emphasize here is the WHO air quality guidelines, because what WHO does since uh, 25 years, in fact, um, WHO uh, reviews the whole scientific evidence to propose how clean air should be or how, how low air pollution should be to protect public health, because that's, of course, what WHO is about. It's about health. and. Um, I have to tell you this, uh, what you see on the slide, they are the air quality guideline values that were published 2005. And over the last five years, we were working in this WHO air quality guideline group, um, where I was a member, we were working for five years to come out, figure out what to propose now as the air quality guidelines. And why was it so, so difficult? Well, the idea is that you propose a value that protects health. Actually, the Swiss environmental law requires that our environment is so clean that it does not damage health. And if you read the law, it's from 1983, in fact, a revolutionary law, it even says it should not affect the health even of the most sensitive people, including children, pregnant women, etc. And that is very tough. So you should use the science to define what those levels are. And I can tell you why it took us so long to then come up with these much lower values, as you see, just proposed last September. The reason is over the last 10, 15 years, many, many uh, risks 
research nations, like Switzerland is, a, is one of the leading nations if it's about air pollution and health, together with many other Western countries with very low pollution, they found over the last 20 years, 15 years, they found more and more evidence that even at very low levels, at levels below the old air quality guidelines, you can see these health effects. So that was a real challenge because it's about protecting health. So we had to be honest and, and come out with these numbers because we know these old numbers, you can show it in many studies with um, an annual mean of uh, 10 micrograms in, in PM 2.5. Yes, you see these health effects in the long term, even on the daily level. Yeah. So that is a reason why this levels had to go down and um, this is uh, just the newest evidence and what does that mean i mean who cannot make laws it has to go back to the nations and the ministries of health of the environment or the council in switzerland or the parliament they have to put this information into a regulation and as you can imagine um, that is also a political process so WHO can only propose what to do and they cannot act, enact it. So this is a, a process that happens um, over the politics. And I will soon show you where we are on a global scale. Um, but to know where we are, we have to remind ourselves, this is also part of public health. Of course, you have to monitor. We have to constantly observe air quality. And I ask you now to follow this link. Um, it's in a QR code. And I ask you, just go to your favorite city. If you see this um, map that you will encounter here, to your favorite city, not Zurich, please, um, anywhere else in the world, the one that you would like to travel to or that you find most interesting. And just look what value this is, this is not a concentration per se, it is type of an index value, but you can translate it more or less into micrograms per cubic meter of particles. Um, just uh, write it into the, into the chat, what city you found and what number you found. And I wanna see a bit what you bring us, yeah? So just go to some interesting city that you feel like you wanna be, yeah? Okay. And you see Zurich this morning had a value of 27 in the middle of the city. So what do we see? Copenhagen, 59. Uh -huh. What else? Any other number? Barcelona, 33. Well, surprisingly lower than Copenhagen. It was always very high when I lived there. Any other proposal? Does anyone go to India somewhere or to Africa? What do you observe? Any other number? Paris, 70, oops, okay. Maybe one or two more. Who has another high number? Who can beat Paris with 70? Any place in the world? You find higher values. New Delhi, look at that, 169. Yes, well, that's a very good place to look for very high pollution. You see Rome is now not so bad, not so good. Bogota, 108, Berlin, 80. Yeah, so you see. So these are the data translated to an index from the whole world. Uh, it's directly... Um, on time and in time information. Yeah? And this is part of the ambient air quality monitoring. Yeah? You need to do that. Uh, often these are national authorities and in Switzerland actually, um, in Switzerland we have the NABEL network on one side as the federal network and we have on the other side the cantonal networks which uh, also do a lot. Um, of monitoring. Switzerland has an extremely dense monitoring network. Um, as you have seen on this map, probably you saw very, very low density of measurements in Africa. 
and this is part of the huge problem we do encounter this inequity in the way um, uh, air quality is even monitored and the inequity of laws and regulations and technological progress. I will come back to that. So yes, so we do monitor and you have seen yourself where, what the levels are today all over the world, you can watch. But my question is the one that you saw in the very first lecture, those who were in this lecture um, this year, this is public health when we had all these technical problems at ETH. Um, I raised this question again, it's one of the quiz um, we had in, in Dubai that Emily has mentioned. So let's try it again. I give you a chance to answer here. If you go, if you follow this QR code, you can, um, you can ask, uh, put your response and uh, I will show you what the responses are. I'll give you a few seconds. So this is the question of what do you think how air quality changed? So these monitoring systems, what data do they deliver over the past 30 years? So these annual means, what do you think? How did they change around the globe? Did it get much worse? much better almost everywhere or much better in the West and much worse in Asia and Africa. Please put your answer immediately now. I hope it works. Five, four, three, two, one. And what is the response here? Okay, well, some believe it's much worse and the majority believes um, C is true. Well, I'm very, very glad to see this result because I tell you, uh, it could actually look even the other way around. If you go to lay people on the street, um, unfortunately, there is this opinion that everything got worse or gets worse. And this is fortunately not true. Of course, we have many, many things that do get worse, but if it's about air pollution and in fact, other, many other environmental factors, it is not true that things got worse everywhere. So I will show you actually the data. Michael Brower has uh, used also the global burden of disease data to summarize what's hap what happened globally over the last 25, uh, 30 years. And you see here, this is this general trend from pretty high pollution to rather low levels in all the countries where you have seen the adoption of clean air policies. Of course, there is variation, but there are many countries with exactly this pattern. And these are all the Western countries, including also Eastern Europe, yeah, to emphasize that. So they have all seen this drastic improvement. Um, what does that mean? I mean, I grew up in this uh, Alpine city here. Can you imagine when I was a boy here in elementary school, I was exposed to higher air pollution up in the Alps than a kid today in the worst place in Switzerland. Yeah. So on the worst street in Switzerland, um, you, you may pick whatever apartment, ambient air pollution is now better than it was 50 years ago, 55 years ago um, in the Alps. So that is an incredible success, yeah? an incredible improvement. So and here you see the summary for the Swiss, uh, the federal data. So you see, this is really impressive. This is now the PM10. Um, if, you, if you go down to 2020, in fact, all these official federal stations, monitoring stations, they comply with the former WHO air quality guideline value, which in Switzerland is in fact the standard. So this is the legal standard, 20 micrograms per cubic meter as an annual mean. So this is amazing. I mean, an amazing improvement. So, but here comes the other side of the coin. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, and that is very true, there are all those regions in the world which are very often not only the most polluted ones, but in fact, they are the ones where you still see increasing pollution. Year by year, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And that, of course, is an absolute uh, impossible, unacceptable situation. Yeah? It's a shame that uh, part of the world is not participating in this progress that the Western countries have established over the last 30 years. So they know how to do it. They know what the right steps are, but this is not globalized. So actually, if you ask me in terms of an outlook, it's very clear what we need today is not more research on health effects of air pollution in Switzerland, um, but we need, we need to do the right things to help that these standards, the monitoring, the air quality standards, the emission standards, and in fact, all these management plans that those get globalized, yeah? This must happen, otherwise we will never see any change, in fact. Yeah, and well, I show you an example um, of what's happening on the policy side across the globe. We looked into that a few years ago. It's very sobering, very unfortunate that uh, in some regions of the world, there is very, very little policy action. Yeah, so they don't use the scientific evidence to create policies. And that is really, really a problem. And um, I very much hope WHO and other international agencies find ways to make a change because this is just not good. And actually, I tell you, this is not just the problem of those countries to finish my lecture here with this example. Um, the problem of Western countries is, well, we have very much improved, but some of our improvements are due to outsourcing air pollution from the Western countries to those um, other countries. And actually, this is a very concrete example where Swiss traders, very, very influential traders of crude um, commodities, uh, they are very dominant on the African market, for example, in, in, this, in this study here, diesel. So what are they doing? They sell the dirtiest possible diesel in those countries in Africa where they don't have the right laws. So you see in Switzerland, it is not allowed that the diesel has more than five ppm sulfur and sulfur is the driving force of pollution of very, very low sulfur. Um, but you see in, in Africa, the Swiss companies, they sell something which in Switzerland would never ever be allowed. Yeah? And of course, they, they would know how to do it better. They just don't do it because in those countries, it's not required. And the world is full of such examples. And these are the reasons of this really, really uh, bad inequity all around the globe in the developments of air pollution on one side and the development of clean air on the other side. Yeah, so my conclusion is we should really find ways to globalize these trends. And um, I want to stop here and just open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Um, this week, me and Elisa will will moderate the discussion. So if you have question, you can type it in the chat. You can unmute yourself and we will ask them. Does anyone already have a question? Um, maybe then I will start with mine. Um, I wondered how big the impact is when we change the cars. Like um, electric cars are getting more popular, but many people that don't want to have electric car cars say it's because also the pollution from the production is high. So what do you think about that? Well, um, Carmela, this is a very important question. And um, as, we, as we now see, no matter whether we like it or not, 
there is a huge trend toward electromobiles. So the question is not anymore whether we like it or not. I mean, Tesla and all the others, they are there. Uh, they are success stories. So the question is how to make those cars not becoming a new problem or a bigger problem than what we had before. Of course, if you narrow the discussion down to air pollution, um, which I could say I do uh, tonight, of course, yes, this is one of the solutions. So you will actually see, I have shown these trends. These trends will go further down exactly for that reason, because this dramatic change toward very, very clean cars and even no zero emission cars will continue to very strongly influence air quality in a good sense in, in, in Europe and, and other places. But again, with this discussion, we are back to this question um, what happens with all the old cars? And as you know, or may know, they, they are shipped to Africa. So all the dirty cars we are shipping to Africa. So do we really want to repeat this um, history of inequity and see the whole West move into electric, um, electric mobiles, whereas the rest gets the pollution? I think this is not right. And of course, you refer to all these other problems. I mean, there is the issue of batteries. And I mean, there are a lot of new challenges. I'm not saying there are no solutions, but we have to be very, very cautious and not just look into air pollution alone to, to promote uh, electric mobiles, but really see the bigger picture and have a life cycle, life cycle assessment, in fact. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe I can pick up from here if the answer is over. Um, I'm going to introduce myself shortly. I'm uh, Elisa, I will be moderating today too with Carmela. Um, I see that nobody has asked the questions, but uh, I can ask my own. Um, I wanted to ask about the role of methane emissions from animal agriculture. I wanted to ask if it was between the most significant um, problematic gases or Perhaps, for example, compared to uh, transportation or such, what is your opinion? Well, um, Elisa, that is a, a very, very important question. And it really depends um, where you look. So in general, on a global scale, agriculture is very important for air pollution. And actually, you mentioned a very interesting one, the methane. Um, it plays a role in, in, in general air pollution to some extent, contributing to the buildup of, of some particles. Uh, but, but there, it was not a very dominant discussion in the last centuries, um, decades. But in fact, methane is one of the climate forcing gases as well. So this is a very interesting opportunity, in fact, to take action on a, on a gas uh, which is both relevant for climate change and also for air pollution to some extent. Yeah? And in some areas, of course, it depends where you go. I mean, some areas, uh, air pollution is very much driven by agriculture. Yeah? Whereas in other areas, it's far more an issue, let's say, of coal, coal burning, or even of open trash burning. I mean, in many African cities, um, they try, or in India as well, they, they burn the trash all over. Um, so it really depends, but the, 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 the point is a very good one. And actually the, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition has promoted um, a pledge for the reduction of methane from a clean air and climate perspective last year um, on the level of the UN uh, in last fall. So this, this is a very important aspect and has a, a little bit been forgotten in the last 20 years. Yeah. Thank you, Elisa. Um, so it can be said that limiting the amount of meat that is consumed by the individual um, also helps um, air quality. Yes, you're totally right. Of course, this is this bigger picture of what is a healthy diet and a healthy behavior. And yes, you're absolutely right. Um, a, a more balanced diet where where the, the meat is less dominant than in the current world. Um, of course, this helps in the reduction of all these nasty gases that um, are due to the 
to this overheated type of, um, of, of heat meat production and agriculture, related agriculture. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, I see that there are still no questions in the chat, so I invite you to ask any if you have. Um, Jason has raised uh, his hand. You can go ahead and mute yourself and uh, ask your question. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for the, the talk, Nino. It was really good and really interesting, and despite the short notice for yourself. <laughs> Um, so maybe it's it's more of a, I guess, a political or philosophical question as opposed to a scientific, and maybe it's a bit pessimistic on my end, but, um, you know, similar to climate change, how can we see this, you know, kind of global cooperation and unity to address air quality, um, given what we've seen, you know, with many countries during COVID, how many went inward, and now we're seeing, obviously, these, you know, geopolitical rivalries. I mean, you know, with the action in Ukraine, I mean, how could we act in global unison? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that, uh, that major problem. Well, Jason, of course, you're totally right. We are, we have reasons to be very concerned and think a lot about what you raise here. And um, the pandemic has pushed us very much. And now again, Ukraine pushed us to think about that. I, I think there are some reasons to also see some signs of optimism. Um, I mean, as you have seen the curves that I show you, these trends, these are very long-term trends and we must be patient. Yeah, I mean, China will not be clean uh, five years from now, but there must be the trend that goes in the right direction. And what we do see also thanks to the technologies that we now have, collaboration interestingly enough has has not become worse in one in some way collaboration exchange on a global scale has improved and um i i see a chance there i mean now you see this for example the solidarity with ukraine i mean this is unprecedented i mean 20 years ago we were we would have been even technically unable to react in the way the world is now reacting and you saw exactly the same actually in the pandemic. I mean, that was the most fascinating part of the pandemic to see that the globe together looks for solutions to a problem they all share. And of course, Jason, you have heard my, my, my statement about equity. We have a huge equity problem and the pandemic has increased those inequities drastically and i mean we as public health people we knew that from the very beginning and we have warned already in, in 2020 to pay attention on that and you see exactly the same with ukraine i mean now everybody talks about the impact of the of the sanctions in russia but we all know some of the poorest countries in africa they heavily depend on russia so if russia's economy is collapsing they run into hunger yeah so I mean, these these inequities increase under these um, stresses that we see with these huge crises. But overall, I honestly, I'm 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 I tend to be more optimistic in the way of having instruments these days and collaboration networks, which help that on a global scale we we, we move in somehow in the right or can move in the right direction but but of course it needs patient and it is your generation that continues to fight for it and does not give up yeah thank you that's very insightful so anyone else has a question want to ask something um you had mentioned about um obviously how things are dumped in, in other countries that would never pass uh, in the Western world. I was wondering um, about ethical guidelines on that, because obviously for the countries that are receiving those things, they don't have any issues with it. But are there any ethical implications for the Western countries that do know better? And are any companies and organizations adhering to any such guidelines? 
Well, Emily, well, yes, this is uh, also very interesting. And I mean, those who followed politics in Switzerland in the last three years um, uh, may remember it. We had this very hot discussion and had to vote actually on a proposal where our ethical standards would need to be globalized for Swiss companies. Um, the majority of Switzerland agreed with this concern initiative, but the majority of counties uh, disagreed, so, so we failed with that. But similar discussions actually run not only in Switzerland, I mean, also Europe has discussions of adopting such kinds of regulations, which would not allow any more um, our companies to do the wrong thing elsewhere. But of course, again, this is a very long journey. And I think and I hope that um, we all as societies don't, first of all, don't give up to fight for it on one side and on the other side, that we find the way that those counters that lag behind, that they really get this critical mass also of scientists and of honest policy people to move their countries forward. And it's interesting, the example that I showed, I mean, sometimes things change very fast. Some of the African counties were absolutely shocked when this um, NGO, the Swiss public eye, when they published this report of the diesel story. Yeah? And five countries within very short time, they decided to adapt these um, standards of sulfur from one day to another. And they realized supported by a study of the World Bank that actually for from an economic perspective for those counties, this is what this was peanuts. Yeah? It's, not, it's not a problem. So they have adopted new standards for sulfur in a few countries, but of course not everywhere. So it needs, it needs not only the local, and how should I say, the Western policies that change um, uh, and are more ethical, but it needs the countries themselves. I mean, you need standards in the countries and you need uh, governments who have this ethical vision to go for it. Yeah. Otherwise, it will take very long. Thank you. Um, maybe just following up from that, are there actually organizations or well-known organizations or companies who already um, out of their own initiative, I guess, yeah. have taken up some kind of... Sorry, yes, Emily, you mentioned that. I forgot to say that. Yes, I mean, you see that there is this huge diversity. And of course, companies are run by human beings and human beings are diverse. And some of these companies have very, very ethical leaders. Yeah, And they just don't want to do this dirty business. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say whether, I mean, where are the majorities and where is the power? And of course, there is a lot of greenwashing in many companies, but, but I mean, there is a trend. Yeah, I mean, there is a trend of more well-educated young people running companies that try to adopt better standards. Yeah, and um, of course, it, it needs a stepwise procedure and nothing is perfect, but um, I see a lot of changes in that direction, which I think is also positive. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. Good. So let me stop sharing, maybe. So does anyone else have a question or still not? Then maybe I will ask the last one. Um, I wondered in the northern countries, they already have public transport free for all to use. And I wondered whether this is also possible to do here, because sometimes I see when my sister comes visit, Thing, she pays more than double to go by bus than if she goes by car. And with the car, she can go whenever she wants. And by bus, not yeah. really. Well, Carmela, you saw it somewhere in my slides. I mean, there, there is this, there are these general management plans, but there is this local story. And I think one cannot globalize the details of what is the right thing to do in each and every country. What is in general true public transport, of course, is a very important element of clean air policy making. And I mean, those in Switzerland who live here, who are spoiled with this absolutely fantastic public transport, um, they may not even realize in some countries it's simply impossible. So we cannot talk about, about um, not using a car <laughs> because 
there is no other option. Yeah? But as you know, here in this country, we can perfectly live without a car. We have never owned a car at all the time we lived as a family in Switzerland. Yeah? It is possible. So it, it is, is, this is part of the story. And yes, in some counties, you need to make it free. I think still, I mean, if you look in the numbers that use public transport in Switzerland, it seems there is still, well, it, it, it's not it is expensive, but I mean, there are still ways of doing it in a way that it seems a big majority can afford it, but we have to pay attention on that, of course. Yeah, and in some counties, you have to go far cheaper to move people. Yeah, so there is no generalized answer other than saying public transport is a very important element. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. Um, we are, we have um, one more question. So if uh, Anybody has uh, another question? This is the time to, to ask. Uh, you can go ahead and write it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, so I think there is none. So I'm going to ask the last one. And um, it's a short question. I wanted to ask, uh, um, because air pollution cannot be seen, so I wanted to ask what is the most effective way to raise awareness on a topic that uh, is not so evident, maybe? Well, actually, Lisa, this is an excellent question. Um, almost fortunately, we could say air pollution, I mean, not here, but in places where you have really big air pollution, you see it and people don't like it. Also the rich people who live in the same air. I mean, if you look in New Delhi or in China, I mean, it's terrible. I mean, they don't like it. And so it's easier to mobilize people to go for clean air. And we should not forget, I mean, that's what happened in Switzerland. I mean, there, there was in the eighties, it was a grassroots movement. Huh? where also physicians uh, for the environment played an important role. But I mean, this was a grassroots movement to say, we, we want cleaner air because we, it, we just don't like it. It stinks. Yeah. I mean, diesel cars, if you look in the European cities, many of the European cities, they still stink. Yeah. If you, if you just go out of the train station, you realize that immediately. So that is actually a nicer thing compared to some of these other, let's say, radiation or so, where you see and, and smell absolutely nothing. Yeah? So in that sense, it's, it's quite amenable to, to, yeah, to let people move for something because they really see it and they don't like it. And that is good. And, um, and as mentioned, I mean, Switzerland is on such a low level that I don't even think we need too huge, how should I say, movement beyond what we already have in terms of our laws. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you very much. And um, I hope you have a nice evening. Emily, I give back to you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for stepping in so spontaneously and uh, for the very interesting lecture. That we all enjoyed so um, and thank you for also taking the time to answer questions. Uh, I just quickly share my screen so that I can share with you my final slides um, just to let you know what is uh, now coming up next. As you know, um, uh, the lectures are always at the same time, same date, so um, hopefully see you next week, Wednesday from 6.15 to 7.15. Um, the Next week, we'll feature uh, Professor Irina guseva Kanu, who will be speaking on Job Exposure Matrix, a fascinating way to learn about occupational and environmental exposures and their health effects. So um, please do join us for that um, lecture next week. In the meantime, I want to say thank you very much again to Elisa and to Carmela, who um, led our discussion time uh, so well. For those of you who are enrolled in the course, please do not uh, forget to um, also sign up uh, through the Doodle chat, uh, sorry, through the Doodle link in order to be able to do what they have done today, which is to lead the discussion time. Uh, as you know, uh, that is actually a compulsory component of the course. Um, so please don't forget to do that. And if you have any questions, then please reach out to me via email. Uh, in general, as we normally do, we usually close uh, with me encouraging you once again to take a look at the uh, 
SSPH Plus for Sustainable Health quiz if you haven't done so already. I'd be particularly interested to get um, your feedback to this quiz as we're always uh, seeking to improve it and to make sure that the quiz questions and answers are, are understandable for everybody so that everyone can make the most of learning more about public health. I hope um, that you have learned more about public health and that you have been interested in today's lecture. Thank you once again to Professor Nino Kunsley for this fantastic lecture. And with that, I say um, good night to all of you and I hope to see you all again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye.